So, welcome to the Mystifying System D4 Embedded Systems. Uh, it is a talk I did some weeks ago, actually two weeks ago at the System D conference. It was well received. So, I want to know from you guys, who is on the System D bandwagon? Who is the System D haters bandwagon? Who is on the System D bandwagon here? Okay, a couple of people. Who is on the other side, the System D haters bandwagon? <laughs> Not so much, fortunately. <laughs> On the others. Who doesn't care as long as it works? Okay. <laughs> who is on the busy box lovers bandwagon? Who loves busy box? Okay, some guys. You may hate me at the end, but. <laughs> okay, so I will start with who am I? What is embedded systems in this talk? And we all need some kind of definition before we come to approach a, a such a broad term. Uh, the background, some myth that I want to, to remove, and I will talk about the baseline, how systemd can shrink, and how other solutions scale up so we can try to compare them, and my recommendation about super tiny systems, things that people usually use BizBox that I don't like so much, not the project or technology, I don't like the concept of using uh, BusyBox that much. Okay, so who am I? I'm a Brazilian guy. I'm a software developer since I was nine years old. So I think in terms of software, that's how I think about things. I started to work with Embedded. And here, Embedded was the Miami tablet. So not the real deep Embedded that some people do. But it is a form of Embedded, right? And uh, I run Profusion. Embedded Systems, it's a software development services company where we did lots of full stack systems for our customers that required us to deal with boot systems a lot because everyone uh, wants to come to their product behavior first. They don't want to spend time in booting and they don't want to optimize by themselves. Uh, I am a fast boot enthusiast, so I use it to be a Gentoo user. And I did the hacking on OpenRC version 1, version 2. As an uh, uh, embedded systems developer, for my customers, I wrote hundreds of, of init systems. And that's something that makes you learn on how to boot fast, the concepts and all. And I was doing systemd since it, it was public. I was so pissed off with OpenRC that I would write one myself properly. And at the time, I knew Leonard from Pulse Audio, and I was talking to Leonard, and I got to know about Systemd before it was uh, even public. And since it was public, I'm doing that. Uh, you are not going to find lots of commits from me. It's like more integrating that on on customers, and but we also did some uh, initial development on Systemd, like the. Uh, K-Mod, the library to load kernel models, was done by my company, both the K-Mod and the K-Mod integration. Uh, we also did some parts of, uh, to do the native shutdown and restart, be because the first version of systemd relied on external tools to do that. So what is embedded systems? Uh, we need to define. It is a very broad term. So when you go and you ask about embedded systems, people will think, first, it's underpowered. It's not a powerful machine. It's something that should be cheap, so low memory. Uh, it's meant to run some simple applications. Usually it's single purpose, long development cycles. Like you stop now and you are creating one project for like 10 years or more. So you must be careful and do all, everything by yourself. Usually you create your own distribution at the end. And so long deployment. Is that the case? Everybody agrees with that definition. Like, let's ask differently. Who disagree with that definition of embedded? Whoa, it's slow. It's, a good <laughs> it's like, let, let's have a comparison. Medical, medical equipment, they are far, far from being underpowered and low memory. When people design them, they are very powerful computers because they cost maybe millions or thousands, dozens of thousands of dollars. So they, they, and they don't produce as many units. So they can put a very powerful hardware in there. However, that's one of the cases that should last forever, like many, many years. 
Smartphones. Smartphones are embedded, like you or not, but they are a concept of embedded, and they are far from simple. Nowadays, they are not even uh, single purpose anymore. You use your phone for everything but calling people. Okay, and IoT, what is basically different between IoT and traditional embedded? Okay, you have network and data, because now people realize that data has a value, so everybody talks about that. But the idea is also, it's much faster paced. While with a traditional embedded, you do the development for years, and then you release your product, like car manufacturers. With IoT, you are doing this product this month, you must be finished by the end of the month. Next month you release, it will last the field for one year or so, even less than a phone, because people are still experimenting with the market, so they must try some new concepts, and to do that they must be very fast. So, if you look at Resin IO and other IoT solutions, they're pushing for containers. It's like a solution from the, the cloud into embedded. It's something that people wouldn't believe a few years ago. Like, they sometimes one product has like three installations of Ubuntu in that. Because people don't want to lose time doing the packages, so they take Ubuntu version 1, version 2, version 3, and they put them all in the same embedded device. Why? Because they want to release something to the market much faster. So my definition of embedded systems to my mom, or people that ask and say, what is that? It's basically something that is not a laptop or a server. So this is what I take as embedded. It's very broad still. So I'm talking here in this talk about distributions, regular Linux distributions. I'm not talking about micro Linux or micro libc or systems running very tweaked, small little things. I'm talking about systems that run more than one application, okay, because it it's where system D makes sense. And for the others, I will present another solution. And with reasonable hardware. I'm not talking about one megabyte of RAM, four megabytes of RAM, okay? Like the open RT, uh, WRT guys do an amazing work or for, for routers. At least for old uh, routers. So background, uh, as a company, Profusion got lots of requests for fast and efficient boot. Our first project, we had a set-top box that was, that was in 2008, and the set-top box was taking two minutes to boot. It is unacceptable because when you turn on your TV, you don't want to wait two minutes to get a splash screen, right? And thus, we re were required to work on the kernel because it was very old, so we had to do some backporting. But we also had to redo the, the boot systems because it was taking too, lo too much doing lots of shell scripts and all. So we rewrote a small specific purpose in each systems for that client. It would do just system calls like, instead of calling the mount application, it would execute the, uh, it would call the mount system call. Instead of loading the models, it would do the model loading itself. Okay, and also, if you try to babysit other pro uh, process, it is not trivial. Sometimes you think you just fork and that's it. Then you wait bit when a sick child happens, you collect it, it's good. But it's not that simple because some projects will do double forking. Another project will do like a PID file that you have to listen. Sometimes you need to kill a service, but it's not just one process. You have to kill the whole chain. And how to ensure that is not trivial. Okay, security concerns were also growing more and more. Before the embedded system is something that you just run as root, so you disable even the other users and that's it. But then people hack into your software because of some network errors and they got control of your whole network or your whole home. So people start to care more about that. And growing awareness that systems are dynamic. Because before people were very used to do, my system booted, I bring up the network, and the network is alive for eternity. And this is not the case, right? People unplug the cables, people change the routers, people change the configuration, and systems must adapt to that. And also, USB is very common nowadays, and people want to be listening to USB pen drives or USB extensions to your product. Okay? And Fewer, uh, in 
2013, my company got acquired by Intel, and I worked at Intel until like August this year when I left to recreate my company. And while at Intel, it was a very common request to have these guys as well. So I was the manager of a group that was creating a distribution called Ostro. So Ostro project was the aim of Intel to create a pre-compiled, pre-configured, and pre-secured Yocto-based distribution. So you, instead of getting Yocto and reading lots of man pages and documentations, put all your layers together, then you take your whole life building and downloading the internet, we would offer you something that is pre-configured. If you want to extend on that, amazing, you use the Yocto tools, otherwise, you just use that as a base and you start from there. Okay, when I came to this project, we had the previous uh, slide requirements. So it must boot fast, it must be secure and so on. So what that means when I say it must be pre-built? When we look at IoT and embedded, it's very broad, right? Am I doing something for a medical that is very powerful or I'm doing something for a gateway, a router? So it's kind of broad and trying to optimize for both, it's something that is hard. But we need to try to find a solution. And initially the project was trying to support both in its systems, like systemd because it's something that people are now using on desktop, but also uh, like csv in it. And it started to be a pain for upper layers because then you must provide a service that behaves in two modes. Then you must tell the user that if you want to start a system, on, uh, a process or a daemon on systemd is this way, another system is that way. And then you need to explain how to realize which system are you. And time to market and quick development cycles were essential. So we need to deliver things to the user in a much faster paced way. Then we come to, to digest what is pre-configured. When we look at pre-configured, we must take these two first items in conjunction. So if you have a stateless system, that means that you don't ship a state, your system will, if it's dynamic, it will auto-configure itself. And by being stateless, it's easier because if you remove the data partition of there, or there is a crash or there is a new incompatible version, then you don't need to do too much work on upgrades. And you are doing one configuration, at least, because it comes pre-configured somehow. So having a uniform configuration file is some real advantage. So it's not Required is not a must, but it's a good thing to have. And if on top of that uniform file configuration, you could have dropping replacements because there is nothing more annoying than having to edit a file if you are not a human. If you are a human, you go, you read, you comment, and comment, and that's it. However, if you're trying to mix user with some automatic tools, like some configuration from outside, then it becomes a nightmare, and if we could have some dropping configuration frame fragments, then it would be very good. And also, if we could avoid creating our own configuration files, relying on existing configuration files, formats, and documentation, it would be nice, because people need to learn. They need to ask Stack Overflow and things like that, what is the way to set up a service to be restarted if crashes just five times. And Ostro is also pre-secured. So we apply the least privileged rule for a service. That means for each service, we try to drop all the capabilities and permissions and everything that that process and daemon shouldn't be using. And how to do that? Namespaces are useful. So if you can isolate a daemon or something using namespaces, it's nice. You can do that in many ways. And multipurpose uh, systems based on third-party containers are something that is, is something that is growing. As I told you, ResinIO and other guys, they are putting Docker and Docker-like environments on embedded and IoT. So instead of me having to carry about my product using LibA, and LibA got up, up, upgraded by Debian or Fedora or Yocto, 
And is that going to break my application? Maybe it's a third party that is using that. I don't have access to the, co the, to the source. So what they are doing is basically you create a container, you put everything in there, even in your libc, you put all your libraries. At the end, it will work. It will take more space, but it's easier to get to work. So this is a growing trend nowadays. Then we had a few possibilities. We had systemd, upstart, openrc, csv init, and busybox, toybox, manually, and sticking with just that. So upstart, even Ubuntu guys for, fortunately gave up. It is a, pro, a project that I tried at first uh, before coming to systemd. I was an OpenRC user and I tried to convert to Upstart to realize that lots of things that were said were not implemented. So uh, at the time that I tried that, like it was like two, three native services and everything else was just backward compatible. So you couldn't for real parallelize your boot and speed it up. OpenRC, I had a, a not so good experience with both versions. Many bugs, many parallelization bugs, things getting stuck. And CSV init is basically known that it's very basic, so you have to do everything on your own. Same as Busybox and Toybox, so systemd was what we choose. However, this is not easy. When you go and say, we are going to use systemd in every environment, you have people that automatically hate it. They don't even know it, but they hate it. And some myths that I compiled here. First one is too big. I'm not even looking RPM, QI, and hey, it's too big, look at it here. This is the flash that we are loaded on our project, and you are taking it all for the init system. Come on. And it's too complex, like LS, and look at this. How many files, like, you're crazy, this is too complex. Look at the number of man pages. This is insane. It's like I have 100 man pages. I don't want to have that complexity. And for sure, it uses dbus, dbus is XML, and I don't want XML in my kernel and things like that. And this is like bullshit because dbus doesn't use XML, right? It can offer XML introspection. And systemd usage of dbus doesn't even require you to have a dbus daemon. So you can even compile or just remove uh, systemd, you, you can remove the features that use the dbus daemon. Why? Because the only real user of dbus inside systemd is the systemctl. So what talks and controls systemd, the daemon, the PID1. And if you don't need dynamic control, you don't even need that. So you can remove. And they talk over a private bus. So there is no need for the dbus daemon because it's not being used. And this one is also funny because it's done by Leonard and he did post audio. He broke the sound and he's not breaking my boot. And when I show this, even Leonard laughed because <laughs> it's like what people say, right? But he's an amazing guy and he's not the only one doing the project. So we have lots of systemd developers, lots of corporations and users. It's not a Red Hat thing, it's not a Leonard thing, it's much broader. But then, let's look at the first myth. It's like, uh, system is too big, and then you look, it's 18 <laughs> megabytes baseline on an x86, 64 bits. And if you look at 18 megabytes for something that starts our computer, it is too big, right? It's like, if you look in more details, you have three megabytes of applications and 15 megabytes of library. <laughs> it's like, n not small, but, how to compare apples to apples? So you look in more details, like with the slash bin. You look and you have dozens of control, the CTL. But do you really need them? Do you really have them in other alternatives? So they are a nice thing to help you, but they are not essential to the system. So it's like 650 uh, of binaries. Okay, this is with the recent version, because before they didn't have a shared, a shared library, so even the binaries were even bigger. But do you really have a boot CTL in Busybox? No, so why you were accounting B, uh, boot CTL with systemd? You shouldn't be, you should be trying to compare apples to apples. 
you have lots of useful debug stuff, like systemd analyze that shows you the time that each service is taking. You have CGLS, CGLS, so C groups listing that shows you a nice tree and all. CG top that shows which uh, C group is using. Even uh, systemd delta that shows what's the difference to the actual system. So it's one. 1.1 megabyte of useful stuff, but they are not required. However, when you look at the package, it's still there. The package is still there. You have things like ask password or TTI ask password. You should never have a command line prompt on your embedded device. It's not a PC, it's not a server. Why do you have a TTI in your device? Maybe for the bug, but really, you don't need that. What you need is the infrastructure to implement that in your application. So you are doing a medical system that for some reason requires you a crypto password for your hard drive. Maybe you have that security requirement. Systemd will make that easy. It will call you back and say, hey, provide me with a password. And this is done in Systemd. You don't need those tools, but no other tool does that for you. Even things like Sys users. If you're not familiar with Systemd, Sys users We'll take some small configuration files and we'll create the groups and the etc passwd for you if it's not there. Okay? Then you say, yeah, but I don't need that. I'm using shadow. However, you're using shadow, but you're not expecting any user to type the passwords on an embedded system, right? So you are adding three megabytes because of 44K, <coughs> and you should be reviewing that. And also, the other systems don't ship with UDEV. You have to integrate it from outside, so they don't account into that system. But if you want dynamic behavior, you will end with UDEV. Because MDEV is not that good. If you do MDEV, you're doing it wrongly. Okay, and UDEV ADM and the hardware DB are kind of big. And also you have some utilities, like you have a... Uh, a TAPI to, to identify a TAPI devices, and nobody has that. Or a CD-ROM, who has CD-ROM on embedded devices? It's not that common, okay? So you look at the library folder. Then you realize that there is a libsystemd that is like 500K. It's kind of big, in my opinion, but it is there. You have also a shared library that is used by now the, the actual applications, the slash bin. And you have also the actual PID one that is 1.1 megabyte that is not small. So people say, yeah, my PID one shouldn't be that big. Agreed, but without doing any kind of optimizations, it's 1.1 megabyte and it's not that big either. And you look at the folder called UDEV and it's very big. It's one of the biggest folders in the, in the whole setup. It's like almost seven megabytes. However, you look at it, and most of stuff is inside UDEV. That is the hardware database. So if you want to make it smaller, just reduce the hardware database or remove the hardware database if you don't need it. Okay? Also, systemd ships with some uh, NSS, the name resolver, uh, extensions. So it is very nice for cloud setups when you are doing like you have internal machines that you booted, it will automatically assign the machines to the name server, so you can ping them. You don't need to edit your ETC host and things like that. However, eventually you don't need these kind of features or helpers in your embedded. Just remove these files, it works. Or PAN systemd, that is like also, are you using PAN on an embedded device? Why? Maybe you do have a reason, right? Maybe it's a shared like a system that you want to use the PAN for Samba or NFS or something like that uh, as a synchronization point. So some guys will use that, but most of the guys won't. So let's st start with an easy diet. Let's go and compile with OS. Let's disable everything listed by help. And it brings you 7.4 megabytes. That's zero manual tweaking. So you go. You do a configure help slash trap slash sad and you get your command line. 
and that gives you a very a big save. You still have lots of tools in slash bin that could be removed. And looking at UDEV and journal, they are still there. And trust me, although people say you cannot disable the journal or you shouldn't be disabling UDEV, you can disable both. The system will still work. So we are coming to the manual inspection that is exactly removing these guys and trying to make a system that boots. At the end, I will show you a GitHub repo where you can get my configuration files and scripts to generate that. So you can base your work on that on those. So what I call easy diet is 7.4. If you re remove the manual manually remove stuff, then it comes to 5.4. That's basically removing these guys here, like the libnss, these tools inside uh, the CTL tools and things like that. UDEV is still there, okay, and then you go and remove uh, the, the journal. It saves you just 400k. The benefits that the journal brings to you are, in my opinion, much more worth than the 400k that it adds to your disk. So I wouldn't remove the journal myself, but eventually, if you are really tight, you can remove it. There is, it's not a blocker. And if you don't want dynamic behavior, you can also disable UDEV, okay? And that will save you some more memory. Bring it down to 3.9 megabytes. That would be more apples to apples, except this is the full system D binary. There is no like string. You still have the timer, so you don't need Chrome, you don't need at. You have socket activation, so you don't need uh, like XINETD. You have all the full feature process babysitting. You can do based on dbus names. You can do based on everything, like uh, on, on single process, on C groups, and everything. You have services dependencies, so you don't have to manually assign them. You do have namespaces, and you do have capabilities, so you can isolate the process. You can, with one single configuration line, say this application shouldn't get the network or this application shouldn't modify my root FS system. It's not allowed to modify that. So it's all in there in 3.9 megabytes. And then you can come and say, yeah, but it adds too much overhead to the kernel, right? That's a common uh, thing that people say is after you show the numbers are not that bad. They are not 18 megabytes, it's like four. And then we start with the def config is like 6.3 megabytes, it's too big, so I will ignore that. And I did a very minimum using all no config, and I added some small stuff to pretend it's a usable system, like printk, TTI, enable proc and sys and dev and serial. Then it's 6.668k. It's not that small, you can get smaller, but that's without too much tweaking. And I added the system D, the minimal setup, using the README. If you look at the README of system D, you are getting to know all the K config that you need to enable to, to the recommended one. And then it almost doubles the size, but it's not that big. It doesn't come close to the default size, right? It's, and if you look at carefully at the README, you are going to read that some Things are recommended, but they are not essential. So getting something that boots with systemd, but it's not full featured. So I removed the, the I removed the network because in the, the systemd version here, I do have the network. I do have the SAC comp to filter uh, syscalls. I do have the language, the, the programming language inside the kernel to filter the system calls. I do have the namespaces. I do have everything. However, on the bottom, I have nothing. I don't have like IPv6, not that useful. Block devices, I also remove. There is no like uh, uh, disks or things like that. So 820K is not that big. If you compare, it's just 25% more. And as I said, we are talking about systems that eventually will run lots of containers. So if you get that system, system D is not uh, overhead, it's a saving if you look at it. 
And if we look and say, okay, system D scales down, not so nice, but let's look at the other way. Let's invert the table and take the other point of view. You are proposing BusyBox. How does BusyBox scale up? So I'm doing this small system and then I, need, I will need to do a bigger system. How does BusyBox scale up? Then you look and you say, it's out there. People say, it's all in there. Like journal, you have K log and you have like syslog D, they come built in into BusyBox and it's not, one hundred, it's not even one megabyte of size. Uh, you do have some kind of babysit. You can use any tab for, for that. You can use INETD. They are both built in. But you need to do shell script because then alone they won't do anything for you. How about networking? System D now ships with the System D network D that is kind of powerful. It will do many things for you, so and it's dynamic. So it's actually listening for netlink events and doing things properly. It's not just something that you run and you expect the interface is there, that the cable is connected, and things like that. But for, for BusyBox, people say, yeah, there is micro DHCP client, and you can use that, it's just doing some shell scripts. Okay, and name resolver. So systemd has this uh, resolve D that will take care of mani uh, manipulating the etc resolve.conf. Come on, dude, you can do that with shell script. And hot plug, you do have mdev for hot plug auto mount and model loading. However, mdev is a binary that is executed by the kernel e on every event. It's going to go parse the 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 environment variables, it's going to parse your configuration file and do nothing other than match one another script that is going to run. So it's highly inefficient. If you look at systemd or the other solution that I will present to you later, systemd, udev, they are listening for netlink events, processing those. So there is no fork, no exec, no library linking, no nothing. It's very simple, and the, all the configuration is in there. It's already parsed. It just had to execute, and sometimes, like model loading, there is not even an execution. It's just in-process uh, handling of that. So things are there, but they are not that efficient. Uh, for system users, you can use add user, add group, or you can even do cat and manually uh, edit the files. If you need some kind of locale, like for translations. You can also define the environment variables yourself. Uh, if you need some kind of bootloading help, systemd does that for, for gummy boot and EFI, but for other systems you have to do it manually. Socket activation the others have inetd that is a built-in. Timers, busybox have a crond that is a, also a built-in. And if you want to clean some files like every day you clean files, clean files that are older than something, some date, or files that are, were not modified since some date, then you have to do that manually with shell scripts. And if you want to spawn a container, there is nothing there. You need to manually bring something else. Okay, so only basic, basic blocks are provided. You are left basically on your own if you need to do more complex stuff. Um, it's based on traditional file formats, trying to be compatible with what was there before, so cron tab, and you have to have code on your project to edit all of those files. Because remember, we are not talking about the systems where I am going and typing stuff. I'm talking about systems that eventually an UI is going to modify those, or eventually a web server is going to modify. So you are going to have code to parse and present information about many formats. So the focus is on, of BusyBox is on disk footprint. So you can focus on doing everything on your own. You are forced to. So you are left with the internet, trying to find some MDEV rules, trying to find something like that. So you can put together a shell script and hope it will work. And when you start to have like synchronization between stuff, it gets hard. So Gustavo, what is left to do on super tiny systems? I have a system and it should run just one application so I don't care about this process babysitting. There is no hot plug, there is nothing like that. So I want to get small. So my recommendation for these guys is you use another project 
of mine that uh, this technology inside that project started from a conversation with Marcel Holtman, the Bluetooth guy. And he said something like that, I don't remember exactly, we were drinking beers, but he said roughly that. Dude, if you're doing one single process, like you're doing a Bluetooth <coughs> device, right? Why are you running an init script at all? Just boot your application. Just make your application behave as init one. It's not that hard. You don't have to do much stuff. You do have to do some stuff, but not much. And we started to think and say, yeah, that's right. This Soleta project was meant to be a scalable solution. So it runs on top of Zephyr, it runs on top of Riot, many other OSs con Tiki, and also Linux with systemd. We already had that. We had some basic um, system tasks, like I want to reboot, I want to enter rescue mode. So we could do that. Like, we are already doing that on Zephyr, so we could do that on Linux itself. So the idea is that you create a, a binary that is your whole user space. And you put that together with the kernel, and then it runs FS, and you have a single binary that is your kernel, basically. Then there are nice side effects, like if you're using a, a trust, uh, trusted chain, you can sign the whole thing, the kernel, with the init run FS inside. You sign that, and you validate that with the bootloader. After that, your chain of trust is <coughs> complete. And they were using that on BlueZ, so we took some inspiration from that. And if you're willing to go very small, take a look at this project. It is a set of libraries. It does allow you to compile into this Linux micro mode. And you can enable or disable at compile time if you want things like network to be bring up, uh, models, if, if you want to auto load models, you can do that. Even auto mount file systems like pen drives, things like that, it can be done using this single binary. You don't need a PZ box and all the complexity and uh, licensing issues associated with that. Okay, so the Soleta project was uh, developed primarily, the first implementation was done on systemd with, from day one, a port to microcontroller unit class devices running Riot, Contic, and Zephyr. Uh, the Linux micro port allows you to have a systemd behavior, so we even use the systemd file formats, like if you want to apply some CCTL, it will apply as systemd would apply. If you want to load, like uh, force some models to be loaded, it will read the same files in the same order. It will mount file systems for you, it will parse FS tab for you and do everything. It will set up your host name, it will set up your networking, it will, as I said, load models with KMod and everything. It will even spawn some process. So if you do need like Bluetooth D, let's say, you're doing a Bluetooth device and you need a Bluetooth daemon. This is a Bluetooth classic, right, uh, when you need the daemon. Then it will fork and wait bit for that. It will also configure your machine ID and even if you need a console, so if you did want to put BusyBox in there for a debug, it will automatically spawn the, the Getty or ATT, a Getty on the terminal. So with that, you can avoid busy box altogether, avoid shell scripts altogether. You can have a static link binary. You can use muzzle as your libc. It will do things like network up that brings uh, IPv6 in auto configuration mode. It will have a watchdog, so it will keep talking to your kernel, so you are not rebooted. And it even allows you to do flow-based programming. So we have an example using GPIO, timer, and OIC, or now OCF. It's 400K user space. That's your whole user space. So it does boot, it does bring up the network, it does uh, listen to events and all, and it's just 400K. Okay? It could be even smaller if it's able, like the flow-based programming in write C manually. Okay, so that's my whole talk. Uh, the scripts that I use to create these are on our GitHub. You can clone and start from that, including the configuration files, the, the fragments for the kernel. So these guys here, you can get from these scripts as well. Okay, 
So I would like to ask the systemd haters, do you hate Blaz or what do you still hate about systemd at this, mo at this point, looking at it? So one of the guys that Yeah, and remember, this we are talking about uh, 64 bits, no hacks. I didn't do any special work on top of systemd, which we could. Let's say you, you go and you don't need some, some feature. You could go and like if death in the code or do some manual work to reduce that even further, but I don't think it's needed with the class of devices that are coming to the market. So even on the routers and gateways, they are much bigger now than they used to be. Things like eight megabytes of run are not that common anymore. People are doing like 64 or even more. So system D is doable in there. Okay, so we can scale down as the kernel. You could go and manually tweak it. Okay, another question from previous haters or people that still hate <laughs> system D that would be asking. Okay, so to your point, I will go backwards. So from the first, the last one. When I was aiming to do my boot one, I was thinking exactly like you. I, I was doing the embedded, so I said, man, I could generate code from that, all that I need as a compiler, and I instead of updating my like OpenRC or even systemd, you have the daemon reload. So I would just recompile and re-execute the program, right? But at the end, this is not what adds too much overhead, right? So if you look at numbers and things like that, because systemd got a single parser that is in the parser, right? So it's not that hard to do, and it is uniform, so the big overhead's not there, okay? So going back, so this is one point, so. Sorry, I, could, I cannot hear you. Uh, I don't have any any measure at this at this moment about this, but at some point I tried to convince Leonard to take a binary format because the system D uh, it does have a binary format internally that it will serialize right. System D if you say daemon reload, what it does is it saves the state in memory, re-execute itself, and resume that state. Right, that's what it does. Because if you are updating a system, PID1, you need some special trick so you don't crash everything and then when you are up again, you lose all the states. So it's going to do that. And I tried to convince Leonard. At the time we did some measurements and the overhead wasn't that big. Like if you try to boot from the internal state or the, the public state, it wouldn't change much. And coming to your hundreds of files, this is something interesting because the files are there, but they are not needed. So they are a helper. If you don't need more than one service, so you can delete all the services and you have a default target that is your single service. So you can do that. So it's not going to parse more files than what you need. However, it comes with a series of handful targets and services by default, but they are not required. For example, one of the services and files that are always there is a backward compatible with uh, init, uh, init v tools, so you can talk over the socket to request the system to reboot, like the power off, the old power off. So you don't need that, you go and remove that. 
but it's there by default. Things like run levels, the services that mimics, I want to go to run level five, it's still in there, but you can remove them, right? And the first part of your question was, Yeah, the dynamic. Some systems don't need it, but take a look at a car. You may boot with or without USB. And you may boot with or without uh, Wi-Fi. You may boot with or without many things. So many products are defined by extensions. So some systems indeed doesn't matter. So you can remove. Like I said, you can't just remove you, Dev, and you're good to go. However, if with time comes, more and more is defined by hot plug and auto plug. Eventually, even inside your system, there is no physical attaching, but you do have some hot plug events as you enable or disable parts of your product. So you, it's not physical, physical, physically un unattached, but you can power off and power on and things like that. So I hope that addresses your question. What what do you mean? It's a uh, GPL. Uh, if, I, if I link something directly into the kernel, which even the init run fast. Init run fast is sufficient. If you do an init or dig, you're basically safe. Okay. That's what people say. And init run fast is is. I'm not a lawyer. Okay. You know, you know the yeah, yeah. <laughs> the, the general consensus, in, at, at least in open beta land, is don't do it. You might be burned. Okay. So. Uh, as an extra comment, for this kind of solutions, uh, at Intel we had a team working on making it possible to run Linux on smaller systems. So what they were doing is uh, enable executing place, and they were putting then a separate instances in the flash, and they would boot the kernel and pass an argument to the kernel saying where is the user space. So not even the, the init run FS, there is an overhead, right? because you have a fake file system, you have to read that, and it's something that you don't need. So what you can do is, you can even bypass the VFS. They were trying to remove the VFS completely, so they would boot your application directly. So in this case, maybe the, the, it wouldn't matter. So indeed, it could be a licensing problem. Any other question? Okay, I hope you enjoyed it. Thank you.